Welcome to worship at Tusculum Baptist Church. I'm glad that you have joined us today. So let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for today. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity we have to worship. I pray that you would open our hearts and our, our minds, Lord, to, to your word, Lord, to your message uh, that you have for us today. And Lord, we know that there's a lot in our world that's going on. We know there's, there's chaos, there's unrest. But Lord, we can take rest in the fact that, God, you are sovereign. You are in control of everything. And Lord, we kn you know that what's going on in our world today does not uh, catch you by surprise. And so, Lord, I pray that we can um, take rest in that. And Lord, knowing that we have hope uh, in you. And Lord, we just, we thank you for that. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can uh, pray together. And Lord, it's in your name that we do pray. Amen. So this weekend, uh, Pastor David and Betty are in uh, Virginia uh, for their uh, son's graveside service. He died on April 3rd. And so you can keep them in, um, in your prayers uh, this weekend as they are doing this, as they're doing the graveside service, and also their family. Uh, they're going to have family there as well together. And so uh, Pastor David has put in the bulletin uh, more uh, about this, and you can read his uh, pastor's uh, postcard uh, as well. So uh, Zachary Feropoulos, he'll be uh, preaching uh, today. And for announcements, uh, what we have is the nominating committee. They will be meeting this Tuesday, uh, August 4th at 5 p.m. Uh, in the sanctuary in the overflow. So just make a uh, note of that. And so just let us know how we can help you. Uh, if there's something we can help you with, you can contact us at the church and we'll be glad to help. And so I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us today. All right, let's sing together. How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and call to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine the soul the soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose I will not I will not desert to his foes that soul though all hell should endeavor to shake I'll never no never no never forsake. Amen. What good promises in that song for us. Um, let's continue worshiping together and let's sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Sweet. 
make the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope. shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love Amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are you are forever mine amen today our scripture verse will be coming from hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, if you'd like to follow along with us. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to this confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive the mercy and find grace with, to help us in this time of need. Let us pray. Our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you now humbly. Thank you for your example that you have brought before us. We thank you for your sacrifice that you made and that you are there listening to our prayers. We ask that you put a blessing upon both this message and this world as we needed during these troubling times. And we ask for your grace and your mercy, dear Lord. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, Tusculum Baptist Church. Um, uh, I am so glad to be able to, to be here with you. Um, well, maybe not in person, but on your screens uh, this morning. Pastor and Betty are out of town this week, so uh, he's asked me to fill in for him. Uh, so I know most of you know me, but uh, I'll just do a short intro. I'm Zachary, uh, the worship leader here at Tusculum Baptist Church. Uh, I am married to Anna, uh, my wonderful wife of four years. And uh, she and I have one daughter, Elena, who is almost a year old. It's crazy to think that she's almost a year old already. Um, I've been serving here at Tusculum for three and a half years now. 
and have really enjoyed ministry here. I've learned so much. Um, and so I, I'm excited to share with you this morning. Uh, today, and Walter's already read a part of our scripture, but we are looking at Hebrews chapter 4, the whole chapter, but we're going to really focus in on verses 14 through 16 today. Uh, these verses are an exhortation to Christian diligence. Our salvation, the hope provided through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, and the presence of the Holy Spirit are no reason to become lax in belief or practice. But we are weak. We are weakened by sin. Our per perseverance is undoubtedly tied to our reliance on God, but his openness allows us to persevere because we can commune with him. So this morning, uh, we'll be looking at three sets of P's, all right? Um, so I know that's really uh, stereotypical having three points, but the way this passage is laid out, there are three main ideas. And so we're going to be looking at three sets of P's and their significance in our Christian walk. So uh, without any more delay, let's jump in to the word, which, uh, which Walter has already read for us. Um, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of background, though. So um, first, uh, the author of Hebrews is actually unknown. Uh, it could have been Paul or Apollos or Barnabas or Luke, but uh, the, the author of Hebrews is unknown. Um, but we do know that he was writing to a Jewish audience, uh, Jewish Christians in the first century uh, A.D. And uh, really, we can date this to 70 A.D. or earlier. So um, he's, he's writing to these Jews who have been undergoing persecution. And, uh, and so uh, why do we know that it's 70 A.D. or earlier, though? Well, um, the way the author talks about the priestly duties in the temple, uh, and you can kind of see this throughout the book, but the priestly duties in the temple were actually in the temple. Well, the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So uh, we can really narrow it down to sometime before that. Um, uh, but the author is talking to these Jewish converts and uh, this persecution, like I, I was saying, they were undergoing persecution. And because of that, they were uh, contemplating a return to the old covenant lifestyle and belief. They were thinking of going back to this old way. Um, but the author says uh, and, and focuses heavily on why the new covenant, why Jesus is so much better than the old covenant. And, um, and not only is it better, but it's greater and there is more freedom uh, than, than the old covenant. So um, here we are at chapter four, and the author is focusing on the Sabbath, which means rest. And he's focusing on this rest, and he's showing why this new rest is better than just the old Sabbath, the old rest. Um, so, so what we see here is that this is our first set of peace. We see the prince's peace. We see the prince's peace that is offered. Jesus offers this peace to all. Um, this rest, it's, uh, it's greater than the Sabbath day. Um, you know, this rest, it was, it was promised in the Old Testament. And, and many, many Jews thought that it was you know, that, that Sabbath, and there was going to be a great Sabbath of sorts, but, but really um, the rest that Jesus promises is better than just a day. Um, you know, uh, the, the author points out that when, when Joshua is speaking of, of rest, um, that, you, you know, you see here in uh, verse 8, you know, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. So it's not just a day of the week, um, but we see that it, it really is a greater rest. Um, you know, honestly, uh, on, a, on a day of rest during the week, we usually end up doing work. I know that um, it, a lot of times, you know, when I was in school, I would, I would finish up homework on my Sabbath, or, uh, and I know, you know, that, that's not really a way to treat the Sabbath, but a lot of times we end up doing work on that day of rest. That's really not restful, is it? But, uh, but what, what we see here in verse 10, we see that God rested from his own works. So if God sets this example in, in creation, you know, he created for six days. On that seventh day, he rested. We must follow this example. So entering God's rest, um, 
What, what does that really mean? How, how is it supposed to be a, uh, a rest of a day? Or, or how, do, how do we see this? Well, let's look there at verse 10. So for the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works just as God did from his. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. So really entering that rest, um, it's, it's not deciding that we're going to take a day off from work or, or that we're going to just not do anything on Sunday other than going to church. But it is it's salvation. We are able to enter the rest of God through salvation, through Jesus Christ. Um, and it's us being submitted to the Lordship of Christ. And uh, our salvation, this rest is by grace through faith, not works. And that's really what this rest is. There, there is not a, a, a shadow of works that's required for our salvation. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything uh, once we become saved, but, but we should know that it's not anything that I can do personally to effectuate my own salvation. Nothing we can do ourselves can save us. We can rest in God knowing that. Let's read verses 12 and 13. So for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Our intentions our dirty hearts, our, our twisted minds, all these things are discernible to God. Um, you know, that we are broken. Our spirits are broken. Sin has kept us from God. So it's not our works that can save us because these works are tainted. Um, our intentions are tainted. Uh, you know, it says here that, you know, the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any double-edged sword. And it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why would we do any good work apart from Christ? Why would we do any good work? Honestly, there would be some sort of other intention than just the good work itself. Why would we do good works if we do not have Christ as the reason? Well, honestly, it probably is so that we can be saved, but we know that that's not how we're saved. So our intentions, our dirty hearts, these things are discernible to God. Our works cannot save us. So we must rest in the Lord. We must trust that our salvation comes through him. But we cannot forget the nature of this rest. We can't forget it. Um, freedom from works as a means of salvation is, is what we are guaranteed. So we are free from those works. That's what we can rest in. But we are not made free from kingdom work. We must continue in that kingdom work. We see in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, if you want to turn there with me. Um, but let's all, let's all get there. I, I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible today, by the way. Um, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. We see here that, that our salvation isn't just so that we can go to heaven. Oh, it's so much more than that. It's so that we can have kingdom work, so that we can work for God. We become instruments in his hands. There's a, there's a wonderful book, um, I believe it's by uh, Paul David Tripp, who it's called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful book, and it's about counseling, but, but really that's what we become. According to this passage, uh, God is working in you both to will and to work to his good purpose. He's using us for his kingdom work. Um, you might say that work is opposite of rest. Um, you know, in, in this whole thing, you know, well, Zachary, we're supposed to be able to rest in the Lord. 
And, and if I'm resting, I, I, you know, you can't rest while you work. Um, and literally you cannot rest while you work. Um, unless you just, uh, you're sitting at your job and there's not a whole lot to do. Maybe you can rest then, but, uh, but you physically can't rest while you're working. But, um, I think back on, on a time I, I, have been to Honduras a few times, and I was able to to go and and help mix concrete to lay a a concrete pad for someone uh, to have a home built on, and it was up on the top of this mountain. It was very steep, and they were almost literally at the very top of this mountain. So we had to walk up this small trail and carry massive bags of concrete and gravel uh, because. Quickcrete is very expensive in, in Honduras, and honestly, it's expensive anyway. But um, we had to mix our own concrete there. So we carried the gravel and we carried the bags of concrete, uh, these heavy, heavy bags. And after we carried them up there, that wasn't the end of the work. We had to take shovels and mix because there was no electricity up there. We couldn't bring a cement mixer and, and just mix it there uh, we had to hand mix it. So we took these shovels and turned and turned and turned the cement until it was mixed. And then we would load it into buckets, toss the buckets into where we were building this retaining wall for the concrete and, uh, and then repeat. And we did this. Uh, it was six hours that day that we were mixing this concrete and carrying and mixing and pouring and carrying, mixing, pouring. And I'll tell you what, I was exhausted. I have not been any more tired. I can't remember a time that I was more tired in my life than that day. But I was able to rest in that work. I knew that even though I was physically exhausted, I was able to rest knowing that, that this work is not for my own good. This work is not for my salvation. I'm not working toward anything but the glory of God. I am working for the kingdom of God. When, when I was mixing that concrete, I knew, one, I was tired, but, but even more importantly, that I was able to rest in the Lord. Um, it's just a, it's an incredible thing, this peace that the Prince of Peace can give to us. Um, so, so we first have the Prince's Peace, but I want to encourage you to look further. And, and here's where we're going uh, to spend the rest of our time in these next three verses, verses 14 through 16. And I'm going to read that again for us. Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. So what are the two remaining sets of, of peas that we're going to learn from today? So first we have seen that we, we are able to have the prince's peace, but next we see that we have a perfect high priest. We have a perfect high priest. And the way this passage is laid out, we have uh, verses 14 through 16. Verse 14 lays out uh, the, these two points. So first, we have a perfect high priest, and because of him, we are able to partake in prayerful perseverance. And I know there are a lot of P's. I, I didn't intend to have an alliterative outline at first, uh, but, but here we are. So, um, so because of this perfect high priest, we are able to partake in prayerful perseverance. Okay. Um, so this perfect high priest, Let, let's just kind of walk through these verses here. So um, verse 14, this perfect high priest has passed through the heavens. So, so not only did Jesus come down to earth and live a perfect life and die on a cross and then be resurrected from the dead, but after he was resurrected from the dead, he, he, well, there's a whole lot going on there, but eventually he comes back to heaven and he uh, passes through the heavens. So through sky and space and wherever heaven is, Jesus is seated physically there 
And this is not just a, a spirit thing. Jesus is physically there next to God in heaven. So he is seated with the Father. So his initial job on earth is done. Um, so Jesus is not going to return until the Father tells him that it is time to come back. Um, so his initial job on earth is done. Uh, and he, he's sitting there in heaven with the Father. So doesn't, doesn't this cause some sort of separation uh, with us? Well, no, for two reasons. Uh, first, we have that uh, we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus provided um, the paraclete, which is the Greek word for the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside and helps. Um, para coming on side. Um, but uh, but the, the Holy Spirit is the one who has been given to us to help us along through this life. Um, but Jesus is the one who died on the cross. And so how are we able to um, interact with Jesus and, and all of that? Isn't he just so holy and so other than we are? No, we see right here, he is holy. He is perfect, but we see that he is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he lived a life similar to ours. He came here. He, he was a, a common person. Uh, he lived a life of a common person. He didn't have uh, just, just banquets every night and, and things that he had to um, you know, attend to as a monarch. No, he lived the life of a common person. Uh, his dad, Joseph, was a carpenter. Jesus, you know, we assume was, you know, a carpenter as well. So uh, have you ever done carpentry? I'm not great with wood. I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm really not. But my father-in-law uh, uh, is a is, uh, very good um, woodworker. And uh, he, he used to work at a cabinet shop, and then he makes things for, for Anna and my mother-in-law and our, our family. So he's a great woodworker, um, and I haven't, I haven't talked to him a, a ton about all this, but I do know that sometimes it can be very frustrating. Um, and so, and even with my own small work in carpentry, which is, again, not very much, but I know that it is incredibly hard to do carpentry without sinning. Um, I mean, you know, imagine Jesus having a mallet in his hand and he's using this mallet and he accidentally smacks his thumb. How in the world does he not sin when he smacks his thumb? I mean, it, it, it's just incredible. But Jesus lived a life without sin. Um, you know, in fact, what we see here um, in, in verse 15, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And even then, it's not even just that he was without sin. The way the Greek reads, he was separate from sin. He was separate from sin. Um, so in our world, we see sin so often, every day. We sin every day. Um, Jesus lived a life just as we did, but he was separate from sin. How was he able to live a life separate from sin? That is just a wonderful mystery that our, our perfect Christ was able to do that. Wow. Um, you know, why then should we falter in our dedication to him? How can we falter in our dedication to him? One who lived a life just as we did, but without sin. Oh my word. We have a perfect high priest. And, and, and let's, let's talk about the fact that he, he is a high priest. And what does a high priest do? Well, a high priest back, back in the day in the temple uh, was the one who really was the uh, liaison between the, the, the people and God. And uh, the high priest would be the one who went into the Holy of Holies um, to speak with God once a year. Um, this high priest, other than, let's, let's talk about not Jesus as a high priest. So generally, a high priest uh, obviously was not perfect. Um, just just a, a regular human, but designated as a high priest. Generally, this guy was not perfect. Um, but he still was the one who was the liaison between people and God. But we see that Jesus, as the fulfillment of the old covenant 
as a fulfillment of the Old Testament, as the one who is taking this place. He is the perfect high priest and therefore able to complete that old covenant. And so now with this new covenant, he is taking that place. He is the one who is up there in heaven with the Father, and he is interceding on our behalf. He is that perfect high priest. And because he's able to, to intercede on our behalf and he's, he's there with the Father. And, um, you know, we, we've talked about the um, prince's peace and the perfect high priest. But finally, I want us to look at we need to prayerfully persevere. We must prayerfully persevere. Um, and we can do this and not just can, but we must do this. And we read here in verse 16 that we must do this by approaching the throne of grace with boldness or boldly, uh, however your translation reads. But we do this boldly. We can come before the throne of God. And um, as we'll sing in just a few minutes, uh, you know, boldly, we are able to approach the throne. I don't know if you've ever thought about meeting a monarch, though. You know, the king and or, or queen of a, a great nation. Um, in my mind, you know, when we think of a, a monarch, I think of the Queen of England. That's just usually the first one I go to. And I think probably most of us do, at least here in the States. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if you think of approaching a monarch, we don't do that boldly in our minds at least we don't we don't go up to the queen in our street clothes and say hey how are you doing elizabeth you know that, that's not the interaction that we would have with the queen right there we would uh or at least i know i would make sure that i had shaved and gotten a haircut pretty recently but not too recently and you know i'd be wearing my best suit probably go buy a new suit uh, make sure that my shoes were shined and um I would try not to sound as um, as southern as I normally do. I would I would I probably would accidentally put on an accent. Um, but but you know I would not just waltz in there casually. Um, it's uh it's something that we need to make sure that if we're meeting this monarch, that we are prepared and that we are going to go in there and. I'm not going to speak unless spoken to uh, that, that kind of thing. But we're told to come before the throne of grace boldly. We see an example of this in, in the Old Testament. If we look at Esther, and Esther goes before um, her husband, the king. Um, she, she knows that if she goes before the king at all without being asked, she very well could be killed because of this. So she approaches and she is very humble and she, she says, I'm so sorry. I just, I need to talk with you basically. And she humbly goes before the throne of her king, even though he was her husband, she has to approach humbly. Again, we are told to come boldly before the throne of grace. How, why can we do this? We can do this because Christ is there already having done the work of the cross. He's there so that we can come before the father and commune with him. Oh, how wonderful. When we come before him, we can ask for grace and mercy. That's the only way that we're sustained through this life. We ask for grace and mercy in our time of need. We see there in verse 16. Um, a lot of times we have just a, a not incredibly tight grasp on what these words mean, grace and mercy. So let's look at mercy. Mercy um, is something that is given by one in a position of power who could harm you. But mercy is given by God, the creator of the universe, the one who is holy and just, righteous, also is merciful and he has mercy on us. Let's also look at the word grace. Grace is this unmerited favor. So not only does he not punish us, but he has favor on us and he bestows new life on us. He has, and it's unmerited. There's nothing that we did. Again, 
Our salvation is by grace through faith. So we are always in need because we are imperfect beings. We are always in need of, of grace and mercy. Um, even though when we are saved, we still sin, don't we? I know that we all have troubles with that. Um, and uh, I believe pastors said recently, you know, if you meet uh, someone who says they're a Christian and they say they don't sin any longer, I would be very careful about that. Um, just uh, take what they say with a grain of salt, honestly. Um, but, but we all sin. We do. Um, even after we're saved and, and it's awful, but we all do. Um, so, so we are always in need of mercy and of grace. So sin, sin has separated us from God, but we are enabled to come before the throne of grace boldly because of Christ and his work on the cross. And he uh, died and he resurrected and now on the right hand of the father, we are able to commune with God so we can prayerfully persevere through the trials of this life by asking God to bolster us daily and hourly. So how can we apply these things to our lives? We've seen that we have the prince's peace and that we have a perfect high priest and that because of that perfect high priest, we can prayerfully persevere. Um, but, but how can we apply these things to our lives? Um, so I want to encourage you that if you are not yet a Christian, you can have this peace. You can have the prince's peace. You can rest knowing that Christ has taken care of your salvation. Um, this is something that is offered to you freely. Um, but I also want to encourage you that if you are a Christian, um, well, a couple things. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Have you been guilty of trying to work toward your salvation? Um, even, even if you've already been saved, have you been guilty of trying to work toward that? Um, thinking that you're not good enough and I need to just do this one more. I need to um, lead one more Bible study or I need to do one more Bible study or I need to, uh, I need to find a 25th hour in the day so that I can, I can uh, do more. That's not the requirement for salvation. You do not have to work toward your salvation. But, uh, but we can also be on the opposite end of the spectrum on that. Have you not been working for the kingdom? Have you been resting too much instead of working for the kingdom? You know, we see, you know, like we read in Philippians chapter 2, that even though we are free from, from working toward our own salvation, we're not free from kingdom work because we are working through or we are working for God and he is working through us. So uh, have you been guilty of working toward your salvation? Have you been guilty of not working after your salvation for the kingdom of God? Um, and finally, uh, specifically just on, on this last point here though, have you been guilty of not listening to God or not speaking to God enough? Have you been spending enough time in prayer? Have you been, uh, been taking, uh, you know, quiet time with him? Um, I know that, that there are a lot of things going on in this world right now that, that draw our attentions away. Um, but, but I would hope that, that this time can be a time where you can draw closer to God, where you will listen to him more, not just, not just say words at him, expecting a response or, or um, asking for him to supply things for you. Um, but, but I want to encourage you to, to listen to him, to speak with him and be ready for him to work in your life through that prayer. Have you spent adequate time listening to God? So, so, um, so again, if you are not a believer, I want to encourage you that you can have this rest. You can know that you no longer uh, have to strive for your own salvation. Jesus has accomplished that on the cross, and it's a free gift that you might have. Uh, simply ask and dedicate your life to him. Make him Lord of your life, and you can rest. And if you are a believer, 
I want to encourage you that you do not have to work for your own salvation. Jesus has accomplished that. But you are called to kingdom work. So let, let's get going on that kingdom work. There's so much to be done right now. And finally, listen. Listen to God. Speak to God. Spend time with him. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you that we can come before your, your throne of grace boldly, that we can, that we don't have to, to grovel and crawl on our knees, but God, we can come before you boldly. We thank you for that. I pray that you would strengthen us, help us to, to listen to you more, learn more from you, and, uh, and that we would be confident in our salvation through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Uh, we thank you that, that, we are, uh, that we have a helper, one who has come alongside us and can, uh, can bolster us every day. We thank you for that. Lord, we love you, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. Um, I'm going to have these questions on the screen uh, so that you can uh, reflect for a couple of minutes, and then we will sing um, our, our closing song. Uh, boldly I approach. Sing together, boldly I approach. By grace alone, somehow I stand, where even angels fear to tread. Invited by redeeming love, before the throne of God above. He pulls me close and nails scarred hands into his everlasting arms. When condemnation grips my heart and Satan tempts me to despair, I hear the voice that scatters fear. The great I am, the Lord is here. Oh, praise the one who fights for me and shields my soul eternally. Boldly I approach. Son, more beauty than this world has known. I'm face to face with love himself, his perfect spotless righteousness. A thousand years, a thousand tongues are not enough to sing his praise. Boldly I approach. Boldly I approach your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. By your blood I come welcomed as your own into the arms 
thrones of majesty. This is the art. Oh, this is the art of celebration. Knowing we're free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who made an end to all my sin. This is the art. Let's sing it one more time. This is the art of celebration, knowing we're free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one, praise the one who made an end to all my sin. Boldly I approach. Now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as your own, into the arms of majesty. Let's sing that one more time. Boldly I approach your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as your own, into the arms of majesty. By your blood. By your blood I come, welcomed as your own, into the arms of majesty. Thank you for worshiping with us today. And I just also thank you for uh, your tithes and offerings that you guys have been uh, given. And so uh, you can do that. Uh, you can mail those here to the church. Also, uh, you can bring it by the church. And I'll, we also have uh, it set up on the website where you can give online. Uh, so again, if you uh, need any help or if you have a, a spiritual need, whatever need you have, feel free to uh, contact us here at the church. Also, uh, online is the Team Kid uh, message uh, that I've done, and it's online. And so uh, you can go on there and watch the video, and also there will be a printable as well on there that you can print off. So I hope you guys have a great day in the Lord today.